Alright guys, so I am here with Paul and Kelly from Rack House and Eclipse mm -hmm. Exotics. Um, Paul is an OG gargoyle breeder. He's been doing it for how many years? Uh, a lot. Since the 90s, late 90s? Na mid late mid 90s. to late 90s. So I didn't even know what a gargoyle gecko was and this man was already breeding him. <laughs> um, Kelly, how long have you been doing breeding? 15 years. 15 years. Mm -hmm. Long time. So we got a lot of experience here, a lot of knowledge, and that is why I wanted to come and do a podcast or, or a little video with them because I think that they have a lot of, um, you know, little tips and, and things that we might not necessarily know or, or that might be obvious to them, but to the average keeper, it could help them go a long way. So I wanted to come over here, pick their brain, and uh, this, po this podcast is going to be a little bit more for like, uh, more advanced keeper rather than like the newer keeper and I think these two are the perfect you know people to have this these conversations with you you started obviously with with uh, you, you, you told me Sandfire yeah Sandfire Dragon Ranch yeah. and they were big with the bearded dragons you yes. know and, and a bunch of other reptiles but what made you like what got you hooked on the Rachidactylus and more more specific the gargoyle geckos First time I ever saw a picture of a gargoyle, it was, and now I know, at the time I didn't know, it was a fired down animal, so it was almost all white, yeah. but it had blue eyes. So an, it, it appeared to be a white gecko with, with baby blue eyes. Right. And um, I, I saw the picture and I was like, I don't know what that is, but I, I gotta have them. And, um, and then I went to Alan's place and saw a bunch of them and realized that that was probably my destiny. <laughs> yeah. What about you, Kelly? When, when did you figure out Rachidactylus or Lichiana? the eyes for me, too. And, yeah, the eyes? <laughs> the eyes for really? me. The, the blue eyes for me <coughs> got me, and I was hooked from there on. It, it was pretty much... I saw how cool and all the different colors that they had, too, at the time, and that was just, like, yellow and red, little red spots. Yeah. And, you know, that it, it isn't like <coughs> it is now. Right. Um, but, yeah, I just absolutely love the gargoyles eyes That's yeah funny enough um with the gargoyles i think i think chihuahuas have the coolest eyes really yeah but gargoyles are my second yeah i, I like um the eyes and it's a, it's a mixture of both it's a, the eyes and the, the color palette the possible color palette mm -hmm. yeah which i think um even in the early days, there were some gargoyles with red. I mean, not to the degree that we see today. Right. Um, but there were animals out of the wild that had red on them, and you didn't see that kind of stop sign red on the Chihuahua or the yeah. Crested or any of the other guys. That's like my number one thing I tell people is like, if you want a red gecko, like Crested are cool, but they fire down. Ten years later, they like it fades away. Yes. But gargoyle geckos, it's just you know, it's it's always going to be that, there. that pattern color comes in and it stays. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, and, and I mean, like, aside from the, we, I know you have a lot of red projects, you know, a lot of, um, you do pretty much all the, the full spectrum of what Argo geckos entail, you know, all the yeah. different mores and stuff, but what is your favorite, like, um, uh, you gotta pick Super one. Blotch. Super blotch? Super oh, blotch? You're down. a blotch guy? Oh, hands down. What about you? Two, you too? I'm a stripe guy. I love the red stripes. <laughs> no, that's why we got along so well because yeah. we love super blotches and orange. <laughs> yeah. The, the stripes, so it's funny because now you see things come full circle, right? So the stripes in the animals that we see today is something that we created. That those stripes didn't come straight out of the wild, like, you know, right. perfect stripes, right, right, solid right. dorsal, six, six door, uh, pattern color stripe. Those didn't exist in the wild. That's something that we made, um, which is a, a great accomplish, accomplishment. And I love the striped animals for that. But aside from the eyes, one of the other things I fell in love with the animals is that when you put two together, you had no idea what you were going to get. Yeah. And so now we're at a point where the striped animals, these beautiful striped animals, in my opinion, every single one looks the same, except for the hue or the tone of the color, right? right? I mean, a perfectly striped animal looks just like every other perfectly striped animal. Right. Whereas the blotches still, even though you get super blotches that can look similar, um, when you get down to the nitty gritty and you're comparing them, there's, there aren't two that, that look alike like striped animals. Yeah, I, I think um, I like... Obviously, uh, there's something in my head that's like that clean look of like mm -hmm. even I don't care how many I see I still find it fascinating like just like 
the, especially when it comes to like the red stripes, the, the, the four red stripes going down the back and then when you start adding those two lateral stripes. But the blotch, I mean, I've seen blotches that you guys have at the shows and stuff that are like, the, I am. My blotch game isn't as, as, as high end as, as it should be, but, the, but I admire what you guys have with the blotches for sure. The blotch was the first, the first vision, right? When I yeah. was keeping animals, it was the first vision that I had of, you know what would be awesome if I could do this? And, you know, fast forward a bunch of years. The very first blotched animal I ever I ever produced, it was an orange blotch. It had these just tiny little blotches down the back. Mm -hmm. And when it came out of the egg, I was doing backflips. Yeah. You know? And and my animals at the time didn't have any color to them at all. And so here I got these animals with so much more color than my adults. And and I envisioned taking that blotch and and having it go over the entire animal. And right. and now we're we're pretty, pretty close. Pretty close. We're pretty yeah. close. The yeah, yellows I, are still my favorite, though. The yellows. The yellows. Yeah, and and yellows, I feel like they're harder to much harder. Like much harder to to produce consistently. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I'll produce babies that are yellow as babies, and then they start growing and they start mm -hmm. losing yeah. it, or vice versa. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Animals that are like look black and white as babies, and they get older, they start turning Absolutely. yellow. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Ye yellow. So the way that I see. The genet because of that, the way that I see genetics, the color um, in gargoyles working is not like it was for a lot. Of, it is for a lot of other animals where we can control reds, yellows, and oranges independently. To me, the the best way I could describe it, I I think that red, yellow, and orange are all the same set of genetics, right? What it would, it, it whatever's making color in the gargoyles, it's the same set of genetics for all those colors expressed to different degrees, right? Yeah. So. In the beginning, I could take beautiful, perfect yellow striped animals, I mean, just perfect animals, and breed them all day long and never get a single yellow animal out of them. They'd all make reds. Um, same thing with oranges for a long time. If you got a really nice orange animal, you yeah. breed that to other nice orange animals and you get nothing but red. Mm -hmm. um, only when I started breeding for no color, Right, Adam I was trying to make black and whites. Yeah, and of course, for everything you get a variance. Right. So out of the black and white effort, I started getting some animals that were more yellow, and so I'd hold those back and keep keep working on 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 that angle instead of trying to right. to go from red. You and broke make off yellow. from the black and white. Yeah, and yeah. and made yellow from from nothing, and so now I've got a line of yellow that doesn't produce reds or oranges. All they produce is yellow, and they produce yellow. Consistent. Consist with predictability. Right. Right. I mean, you know, it's it's probably ninety percent of what they what they produce is ends up being a nice yellow base. Mm -hmm. So I, I I was making that point to somebody at the Tinley show um, this past weekend was I don't I, I agree with you that the orange and the red are kinda like kinda like the the, the degree of how how much of that color it has. Mm -hmm. Like, like I think it's like the orange start to stack up on each other and it starts making that red. red. Yes. Um, but I don't see the same thing with the yellows. Um, I, I think the yellows, it's more of like a base color. Cause I have, I have yellow, I don't know about you, but I have a lot of yellow animals that have the yellow base color and that have the red stripes, right? Mm -hmm. And those animals develop it way later in life. Like I have the, a the, the, about the yellow the yellow base coloration yeah, yes. like that were you know not black and white but they they're striped animals mm -hmm. and I didn't notice they started having yellow base till like five six seven years old yeah yeah you know um, so wouldn't it show up well I mean it's so hard to you know pinpoint no, exactly because I, I think that depends are. it just depends on the genetics yeah, it depends too. on the genetics right. of the individual animals mm -hmm. right right same with red base red base takes a yes. while to yeah red base does any yeah. any of the base colors do seem to take right significantly longer to develop right. um, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't say it. most of my lines I think are pretty base color wise are probably pretty well developed by three years mm -hmm. I, I, now that doesn't mean that some animals can't change Right, because I, I've I've seen that happen, you know. Um, there's different life stages, and then once they're like over five or six, is the color different than it was from two to four years right. of age? Yeah, and especially at, at any, I, I think at any given any time, yeah. the base colors are always going to be affected more 
whether it be by time or firing up or firing down, than than the pattern colors overall. No, and even no the pattern what. colors, the pattern colors, they look so different when they're babies, and then they mm -hmm. they grow into that pattern and it spreads throughout their whole body. I mean, I've had it happen to several animals, and I kick myself because. I'm like, oh, I should have kept that, but I mean, you can't keep everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and um, so when it when it comes to, we know that like the red, like the red, we we mentioned it earlier, the red coloration is pretty dominant. It's very easy to pass down. Mm -hmm. um, but how how do you think the stripe works against the reticulated? You know, so like if if I have a striped animal and a reticulated animal, and I breed those two together. What it from your experience, what is happening? Depends. What? It depends on the ancestry of, of those two individual animals. Um, so, and and I think it's important to distinct make a distinction between what happens naturally and what's happening now. Yeah. Right. Because through selective breeding and and all the things that we've done over the past you know fifteen twenty years, yeah. we we have changed the animals. They they don't the genetics in the animals don't work the same way they did. In the very beginning, mm -hmm. um, I mean, there's definitely much more predictability a across the board. Now, wild animals, I, I would argue, I, I, from what I understand, for most species, the wild type would be the reticulated. All right, so naturally speaking, the reticulation should be the wild version. The stripe should be the anomaly that just so happened to work for that particular species. Yeah, and so both of those patterns became. Um, became prevalent in in wild populations. So, wait, so um, from are you aware of any striped animals that are wild caught that came from the wild, especially back then when you were, you know, hanging out with Alan and seeing his collection? Was it was was there any like like legitimate nice striped animals that you were seeing from his collection? Sure, that were from sure. Other wild? Yeah, okay. I mean, um, m most of the. S most of the stuff that we see today is is similar to what what Alan had in the beginning, just maybe not to the same degree, right? So like some of the bright reds, those colors existed out of the wild animals, really? just not not to the same degree, not as much, right? Yeah. That that we see in in our animals today. Right. The same thing with the striping. Um, striping was a very normal pattern, but did did was it common to see these perfectly striped? Animals with a stripe from from the eyeball to the tip of the tail. Yeah, no most of the animals broken. were striped, but they were very broken uneven um, yeah. Random like a, stripes. Like what I call aberrant striping where it's kind of like yeah. zigzaggy yeah. on the side. Yes. Yeah, yeah kind of a lot of them were kind of a mix between um, The blotching and the striping even I guess you could argue now looking looking back because that some some were some people call those mosaics yeah, you know, when the animal shows a little bit of, the, of both pattern. Yes. Um, so now in in captive animals, though, it's hard to say which one is dominant over the other because it really does depend on the lineage. Sorry. So my group thirty is nothing but they're super blocks, right? But it's a reticulated pattern. So nothing but reticulated animals for the past fourteen generations. Right. right? So for that particular line, without question. Reticulation is the dominant pattern um, for my group three. That's been nothing but stripes for the equivalent amount of time. So, any, any animal out of there, striping is going to be the dominant pattern. You know, the dominant yeah. genetics. Now, I did interesting enough because I keep saying that everything is like gene stacking, and so when I do see some of these colors and patterns that are dominant, my next question was, okay, so what happens when you have reticulation in it which is a dominant pattern in one animal and striping which is a dominant pattern in another what happens when you put those two together right like if group 30 put together one an offspring from group 30 put together with an offspring from group uh, three was it and and interestingly enough i think what happens if you know how positive and negative numbers work yeah right? i think it works the same way it seems to be working the same way so if I take a dominant stripe animal and breed it to a dominant reticulated animals, I get they cancel each other out, and I get a little bit of everything. Mm. Um, so I had I did this this experiment last year. I have a my group twenty three, which is black and whites, which makes no color. It, historically, they make no color, right? No yellows, no oranges, no reds, just nice just black, black and, and whites, white. or 
if the in the off ones they would be like maybe like a, a yellow and brown pattern but right. most of them are black and white and so I took a group three which is dominant in stripe and high pattern color bred that to a group 23 which is dominant in retic and no pattern color and I got not, neither they canceled each other out so I didn't get any really white animals and I didn't get any high-end really colorful animals I got mixes of patterns so I got both stripes and reticulation okay and most of the animals color wise were a light base with a little bit of pattern color in them so two opposite genetics that are dominant cancel each other out that's why I say if you positive and negative numbers kind of right right, same, right, right. same principle so like on average would it be like <coughs> right down the middle like 50 percent that are some that are more reticulated and 50 percent that are more striped yeah or unfortunately I, and I kick myself because I don't keep notes the same right. way that I, I used to and I really okay. should yeah um, I, off the top of my head I would I, I don't think it was 50 50 but yeah I mean it was a nice, like, it was a not nice enough balance. not yeah right, it, right. There, was, there was no sway in, in, in either, either one direction way. Yeah. right okay yeah now with with uh, like the reticulation there's uh, like different degrees to it you know there's a banding we talked about the mosaics that yeah. might have some striped influence because mm -hmm. it looks like the bands just got pushed uh, horizontally mm -hmm. by the stripes. Um, do you see, have you done any experimentation with the bandits? Maybe like an animal that's that has multiple generations of bandit uh, in it versus like a w one that has multiple generations of like really busy reticulation to see what happens when you put t both together. Yeah, mm -hmm. what is what's what goes on with that? So the animal that you saw at Tinley, the one that has the stripes on the side and it's completely blotched looking, that pattern, that that bicolor pattern, that is from that. Okay. I made the whole body colored. Okay. But that's from my stuff. I can't say that for right. everything, but that's from. Yeah, because I think it ultimately the same thing. It comes back to the the actual individual animals. I play yeah. a lot with like mixing the different ones. Like right. I have I have groups that are all different kinds and I love the funky patterns. It's like my thing. Yeah. And I just I just love the bicolors. The bicolors with the orange and the red. Yeah. That's like really, really, really something that I love. So I always try to get that and that that animal that you saw at the show. Yeah. That one that one was a keeper, <laughs> for sure. Right. The bandits, I have I have a line, my, my group too makes some banded animals. Yeah. Um, and it is something that I've tried in the past. I don't currently have a, a group that's focused strictly on banded, on, on banded animals. Right. Um, I, I, I did do it for a couple seasons in the past. And unfortunately, I, all the animals, all the adults that I had, at least for that particular group, were all what I would consider banded, but they really didn't make any banded, <laughs> banded yeah. babies. Mm -hmm. So it's one of the reasons why I, I wouldn't consider, at this point, I wouldn't consider mosaic or banded a morph. A, you think it's just a, a variability? It's, just a, it's of, a variant, yeah. 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 I, at, at least for me. To me, mm -hmm. a morph in the gargoyles w should be something that, you, that can be produced with predictability. I mean, well, the stripes and the retics, Period. When you breed them, you're gonna get, even if you you mix them, you're gonna get one of those two. Yeah. 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 Right. I mean, yeah, it's I not think, like you can take two think, bandits and get banded babies. It just doesn't. Right. Work that I way. agree. I, I I think the the term morph is more of like how we just describe the phenotype, like how we just describe how it looks. Not so much that it is, and I could be wrong. Um, but I think how people use it is more just like to. To make it easier to explain to you what, you're what I have, what I see, without right. having to show you a picture. Right. Mm -hmm. right. You know? Yeah. Um, I, I had a, a conversation with a an actual geneticist one time, and so when I was throwing around some of these terms... Oh, yeah. She He's was, cringing. She, oh, my God. She was giving <laughs> me the evil eye because all these terms that we use don't They're mean... They're not... Yeah. They don't mean the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. So, yeah. It's, so, I was talking... There's a... Uh, there's a couple of guys that are doing a lot of work with crested gecko genetics and stuff. And even when talking to them, they're like, we, we got to stop saying codom. It's yes. incomplete dominant. You know, yes. like it's like little things like that, that the average person that's into, you know, geckos or reptiles, they say codom, you know, this is a lily white, it's a codom gene, you know, mm -hmm. but it's actually incomplete dominant. 
And I can't sit here and explain to you exactly <laughs> why. But I'm just, no, I know. I, but but it's uh, it was over my head. That's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it's it's um it's interesting though. I think the more that definitely adds like uh aside from the value it adds to the animals, it adds like more interest to people to sure. get into the hobby. Sure. So that's why I'm like every time I see like um a new morph. I get so excited and I get like super amped that hopefully it's just something genetic that we can start reproducing a lot yeah. because I think it brings in more people and more people more. get it exactly. Excited. And, it, and it will come. Yeah. I mean, if, if being in the reptile business as long as I have has taught me anything, it's that everything that's kept on, on a large scale, yeah. you're eventually going to see albinos and other other sorts of mutations pop up. I mean, we, we're seeing it with the crested geckos, yes. you know, lily whites came, yes. cappuccinos, now there's the sables, there's this, that, the other popping up. And we have one in, in the gargoyles already, perhaps, wh yeah. whatever whatever this is. The white, the, yeah. the white gargoyles. Hypomelanistic or amelanistic, I'm, I'm not sure which which route to go with that one yet. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm excited to see, I'm excited to find out, and I know you guys have one, obviously, I have one as well. Um, there, there's probably other people out I'm here. Sure. If you have one, hit me up, slide yeah. into my DMs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, uh, uh, yeah, I think, I think We're it might interested. be out there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, I think there's definitely more out there, but I don't know if like, since like, cause I've, I've had white, I call him white boy. I've had white boy for, you know, probably like four years now. And, and when I first got him, I thought, I'm like, oh, that's such a cool gargoyle. But I never really thought about it. Like, I thought about it like, oh, it's just another, like, this is an, just another an anomaly, you know? Another version of a gargoyle. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then talking to some other people and then with this whole thing with the crested geckos, I'm like, what was I? Like, why am I so dumb? Like, I should have been, like, on top of this. Because I've sold, like, offspring of, like, white bull, like, a while back. And then now I'm like, no, I'm, I'm keeping back everything and I'm going to start crossing things to see what happens. Mm -hmm. uh, but have you guys seen the what a friend of mine is calling the clown project? Yes. Yes. With the circles. Mm -hmm. in, in gargoyles? In gargoyles. Mm -hmm. No. I know who you're talking about. Who? Matt. <laughs> Matt. Yeah. No. So you haven't seen it? I'll yeah, show you right now. It. I have a picture. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so, maybe, maybe so I have seen it. Seen it. I'm sure that's you have. I'm you sure you have. That's the one you said that you wanted to buy, and he bought it first. It, this is the one from that's this one, the one from, from Boris. He oh. imported it. Well, I think Boris had one like that too. So where did that one? Come that from? one from that Canada. One's Canada, yeah. Uh -huh. So this animal, he uh, he was able to reproduce that same exact yep. pattern. Mm -hmm. Now he he had he hasn't had the best year uh, with with uh, breeding, but. He was able to reproduce it um, with a, another animal that wasn't as, they didn't have that same exact circular pattern, but it was kind of like, it still had the pattern. It, yeah, it had a little bit of like a faint patterning of it. And he was able to reproduce it with that animal. And then a, a season previous to this one, he bred it to like, a, I think like a regular red stripe and didn't produce any. Mm -hmm. And then I did see a picture. I can't find the picture. I don't know where that picture went, but. A while back, I saw a picture of some guy in Europe that hatched an animal even crazier than this, which was a black and white, but it was a lot more swirling yeah. on the whole body. Mm -hmm. And I don't know who that guy was. I think somebody showed me the picture, like yeah. secondhand, but I saw that picture and I'm like, yo, that's like crazy. And then, and then I remember a couple years back, Matt got this animal, Matt and Eric, and I was like, oh man. I hope they prove it out because that looks really cool to me. Like this, this gecko looks like. I would love to play with that with oh my Oh my God, so, I know. <laughs> so I had, we had a conversation at Daytona mm -hmm. about genetics with a lychee breeder. Mm -hmm. And the question had come up. Now this is, so I had done a lot of experimentation with incubation and stuff with, with gargoyles and pictus and a bunch of other stuff. And um, one thing that I never did, so I, I don't believe that gargoyles are temperature sex dependent. If you ask me, I'll swear up and down that they're not. Okay. Um, the question that I was asked when we were talking about that was, did I ever play with temperature for color? Like, you know, how they do with leopard geckos. Yeah. And I, I, never, I never did that. But 
I have had a couple instances where things hatched out prematurely, like they pit the egg prematurely, mm -hmm. and the color on these things, you know, they didn't survive, but the color, on, it happened three separate times, the color and the pattern on these individuals was crazy. One looked like a zebra. If I had to, like, if I had to put yeah. a, mental, a mental picture in your yeah. head, it looked like a zebra. So I'm wondering if maybe some of these didn't come about by playing with temperature, with temperature? during incubation. Um, Although if he I don't know. I don't think so because he – so he produces like other gargles and other crusts and stuff and his mm. temperatures are pretty consistent. I've been to his place and um, I've never – you know, he went from talking to him and from being there. It's like any other gecko breeder I've – been to Mike Matt's a good guy I almost called him Mike sorry yeah so like it's like I don't know if it's so much that but I, I was curious about that and I did want to ask you about that because I remember I don't know I think you did a podcast a while back that you spoke a little bit about like testing temperatures and that oh, yeah, you're getting like 90% females for the most part right yeah in in, in the early days I, I would hold back 300 animals every season Wow. Until I could sex them, yeah, one hundred percent, and um, and because I was wanting to know what my ratios were, and you know if, if incubation had anything to do with it, and yeah, for like the first ten years, I, I would see less than five percent male. Less than five percent. What, what temperature than, are you uh, incubating at? at? At that time, I incubated everything from like sixty-five to eighty-five. I, I tried really? everything, and I saw, and that that's this is why I swear that they are not temperature sex dependent because. Um, I hatched out males um, at temperatures in, in the 60s, 68, 69, and I hatched out males at 85 and 86 degrees. Did so, it, was the ratio pretty much the same throughout all the temperature range? Like like at the 60s, was there more females, more males, no, or, because or 85, more females, more males? It, in, 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 most, in most of those experiments, most of the opt, almost no males. I mean... So there, there was no correlate. In, in, in all my temperature fluctuations, I saw I didn't get any amount of males. The males would just all be random, one or two here or there. And, mm -hmm. and nothing that suggested it had anything to do with temperature or anything else for that matter. Um, when I started really paying, after I started building up notes, what I did see, start to see is that the males that I was getting, like, Every once in a while, it would jump up to like five or six percent, maybe even sometimes in double digits, like ten or twelve percent. Yeah. And especially when it would jump up, the those years that it would spike, when I go back and look and see where those males came from, they'd all come from come from one male. And so I started. They they come from one particular animal. One particular animal. Oh really? Yeah. Yeah. And so then I started paying a little more attention to individuals and not so much the temperature. And so as time went on, what I did find, actually what, what, what really ignited it, because I had my, my theories on it, I, I kind of felt that it was, um, it was genetic. And then I was online one day and the question had come up and a gentleman in England had jumped into the conversation was like, I swear I got it nailed down. You know, I figured it out. I make 100% male all the time. And everybody's like, oh, what, what, what do you do? What do you do? And he was like, well, it's the opposite of everything else. You incubate low. If you want males, you've got to incubate low. He said, I incubate at 72 degrees and I get 100% male. And so uh, I'm making the same face that you're, I'm listening to it, making the same face you're making <laughs> and going, well, that doesn't make any sense, man. That goes a male. So, <laughs> so I, I contact him, right? And I start asking him a bunch of questions and we're going back and forth. And I'm like, dude, how many males do you have? He says, "Well, I only have one male." I'm like, "Oh my gosh, that's it. That's the answer. Yeah. You have one male, and you're bringing it to all these females, and you have a male maker, and he's making 100% mm. males." And so, we we had identified male makers in in both of our groups. She has she has more than I do, right. um, but there there are some males that never make males. Yeah. There are some males that make males randomly. I can't give you like a percentage, but right. very, very randomly. And then, then there are some males that are what we'll call male makers, and they make damn near 100% male regardless of what you put them with. And this is actually something that I've, I've been trying to put out in the, the last year or so because um, 
there is a trend that I've seen in the gargoyle gecko community over the years, right? So if what I saw in the first 10 years in my collection is a reflection of the wild population and the wild population is in fact a female heavy population naturally, and there are things that I believe I know about what I've read and about their natural habit that seem to make that idea make sense. Yeah. Um, what I've seen over the years now is if you go online, you go to reptile shows, um, males are becoming more and more available. Mm -hmm. And in fact, if you, especially I see it online in some of the groups where people will post up and say, you know what, I go to a reptile show and I can't find a female, you know, and somebody else will get on and go, well, I can't find any males. That's really weird. And so when you start to look at where these people are, there, there's, there's a pattern there. There are pockets where there are lots and lots of males available. And, and I believe that is absolutely because it is genetic. Mm -hmm. And so here's, here's, the, here's what I see happen. Once we realize that, 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 that it is genetic, my next, and we have a male that is making 100% male, my next question was, are those males? Are those males male makers, right? And so we raised up a bunch of those males. And again, I can't give you numbers because we didn't keep them all. And, yeah. but. Bad. The ones that we kept, a large per percentage of those are, in fact, male makers also. Interesting. And so, again, we go back to if the population is naturally female heavy, if the way that it's supposed to work is that they make mostly females, but you have these male makers because every once in a while you need, you need to bump up the population, right? Um, in captivity, we're keeping every baby that hatches. In, in the wild, you got a male maker. How many of his offspring are gonna make grow up and contribute to, to the reproductive yeah. pool? Um, probably not very many over the lifetime of that animal, right. right? So in captivity, you have a male maker, and say like in our situation where we're breeding groups, you got a male maker with five females. Mm -hmm. We average 10, 10 babies, a, what, when I'm counting, okay. 10 babies a season from each female, right? So if I've got him with five females, I'm making 50 males a season. Mm. And, and putting them out there, yeah, right? And if most of those are male makers and you keep doing that and you keep doing that and you keep doing that, I do see a point in time where the gargoyle community could be very hard up to make females, right? Because we we bottlenecked ourselves into is, a genetic corner. Is there corner. such thing as, well, kind of like judging from what you've told me just now, there, then there would have to be some that are female makers that are not producing males. Well, I, I would say that that's probably standard, right? So normal is all female. Okay, so if if a couple things hold true, right? So as far as we know right now, gargoyles are only found on the lower two thirds for the most part. I think there's been a couple records of them found elsewhere, but for the most part, they're in the lower two. Even if they're not, even if they're over the whole island, because I, I don't think that makes a, a whole lot of difference. Gargoyle is the top of the food chain. It's pretty damn close to the top of the food chain. In captivity, they're living 30 years. Yeah, um, there's I, I've had animals that were field collected from Frank Fast in 94 and still reproduce in 2018, right? So they're 30 something years old and still reproducing. So if that's normal, you have an apex predator on an island that lives 30 something years, right? The females are capable of parthenogenesis, mm -hmm. which again, mother nature doesn't do anything without a reason. So why? Probably because she doesn't, they don't all come in contact with males frequently. Right. Um, so if you have a captive population that's living 30 years, they're at the top of the food chain, how many males do you, does that population need required to keep the population going over the long haul? Mm -hmm. And in my mind, it doesn't need very many males. And that's probably why they're capable of parthenogenesis as well, because right. males naturally are not very common. Um, but that's because they get predated upon, you know, they get eaten by other gecko, uh, other gargoyles, lychees, bird, whatever have you. In captivity, that's not happening. Every single one that's being produced by a male maker um, yeah, is hatching right. and going out. Yeah. And so, yeah, that that could be a very big problem in in the future. Have you, um, what, going back to the incubation thing, have you tried incubating at a certain degree in the first? four weeks and then bumping it up no. or, or lowering it in the last couple of weeks because I know like a lot of leopard gecko breeders do that yeah. for the color thing you know like I think it's like the hotter it is in the first couple of weeks is their brighter colors or something yeah I'm not sure but but they I know they play with that 
And I'm wondering if with the gargoyles we could kind of like achieve something similar. It, it, it is a th- I mean, it, it's a thought. I, honestly, I, I never, I, I did not do that. The, it, what I was trying to do, I was trying to, my, most of my experiments surra- were surrounded around trying to figure out whether they were temp- temperature sex dependent. Um, but that led to other questions too, like right. long, longevity um, and, and how temperature plays a role in metabolism and lifespan of the animal. And yeah, and I could, I could tell you a couple things, man, that really blew me away. And when you think of it in that perspective, it changes. All right, so they lay two egg clutches, right? I was running an incubator at 72 and one at 76, so separated by four degrees. I'd take a clutch of eggs, put it in one incubator, and put it the other egg in the other incubator. The 76, excuse me, 74, wait, no, 76, 76. incubator would hatch 30 days faster than the one at 72. Right, so 30%, quick quick little math. So four degrees sped up the metabolism that make that age hatch 30% faster than its egg mate, mm-hmm. okay? So I'm going, well, holy cow, that's huge, right? I mean, I see that as huge. Yeah. And, and I think you can apply that to the animal's lifespan as well, right? So one of the things that I have gotten into disagreements with online um, is, if people compare my animals to others, mine are smaller and don't grow quite as quickly as some other breeders. And I do that on purpose because those experiments tell me that if I'm keeping the gecko, say at 76 instead of at 72, I could be cutting, I'm speeding metabolism up by 30%. Right. I, I could be could cutting be right. 30% off the, t- the total end of that animal's life by keeping it at that temperature, so right? and so you could throw a bunch of other factors in there that make it even more mind-boggling. But mm-hmm. so you okay? So then, what do you, what temperatures are you incubating now? Seventy-two to seventy-four. Seventy-two to seventy-four, and mm-hmm. are those the same temperatures that are in your gecko room? No, no. Gecko room, gecko room changes um, depending on the time of year. Right. So. Right now, this time of year, I'd say mid mid to lower 70s is probably the average, mid right? So average. At, at, I'm probably, at this point in the year, I'm probably peaking out at maybe 78 or 79 for a daytime high. Okay, 78, 79, okay, yeah. makes sense. Yeah, like summertime. Now, do you find that, um, I, I've seen, for example, um, Dave, was te- Dave Coffin was telling me that when he went to New Caledonia, um, it, was, it was hotter there than what you know, we think it is. Mm -hmm. Um, So he was wondering if maybe keeping them, if we were keeping them too cold versus, because, you know, most most of the time the whole thing is don't overheat them, Mm -hmm. you know, you're going to kill them, which, you know, especially with babies is very true. Mm -hmm. But... You'll never hear me say that. No? No, never. Why is that? That's one of, one of, there's a couple... Too hot? The too hot thing? No, not at all. I don't think that's too hot whatsoever because I totally agree. A New Caledonia gets to 90 degrees all yeah. the time. No, exactly, so exactly. The, yeah. the, the caveat to that, so you got to remember too um, how how things happen over time, right? So um, care sheets. Personally, I hate care sheets. I don't do care sheets. I stay away from them. I, I, I don't like a set of instructions without context, right? right for, for somebody to do something and not know why they're doing it doesn't make any sense to me. Right. All right. And okay. so two things in, in, in our trade, two big things that I have seen that started out from care sheets as a cover your ass kind of set of instructions turned into something completely different than what it was meant to be. Um, number one, don't let your crested gecko go over 80 degrees. That is an absolute myth that came about as 100% as a cover your ass set of instruction. For people writing care sheets, that was the way to guarantee somebody wasn't gonna come back at them. Mm-hmm. So the number one aspect of care for all, hum- all New Caledonian animals is humidity, number one. And I still argue on, you know, online about this sometimes. Humidity, in my opinion, should be an average 74 to 75%, which means it almost never goes below 70%, right? Now, if you go and you look at most of the care sheets that are out there today, most people see a care spray up to 80%, followed by a dry out period, right? And so what people are now doing is they're spraying it to 80% and letting it dry out to 50% humidity. And that is wreaking havoc on the animal. Now, 
the reason humidity is so important for these animals, you've held enough of them, you see their, their skin is thin, they're absorbing body moisture directly from the air. Like, their skin works like a frog, same, same way, right? Yeah. So if, hey, hush. <laughs> so if you have, if you have especially a baby crested, right? Yeah. An animal with smaller mass dehydrates faster. Right. All right, so if you have an animal at 50% humidity, which requires 75% humidity, and you raise the temperature, you are dehydrating that animal. You are cooking that animal like right. that. So if you're, I tell people this all the time, the shows up all the time. If your humidity is on point, you're averaging 74, 75%, that animal can easily take 90 degrees, no problem. If your humidity is not correct and your humidity is 50, 60%, do not let that animal go over 80 degrees because you will cook it. You will dehydrate it and cook it. Very good point, yeah. Yeah, I think um, it, it's it's hard because like I think a lot of these things we know from experience. Like you can look at an animal and tell right away, you know, it's dehydrated, yes. or or you know, don't do this or that with the animal because you've worked so much with them. But those care sheets sometimes are like geared towards the the people that don't have that experience. So it's like yes, just follow these set of instructions, and then as you keep, you know, as you have the animal for longer and longer you'll start to kind of like mold the care sheet into what works for you because, you know. If you pay attention to the animal. Exactly. Yeah. Very true, yes. Because some people just there, water. Yes, food. yes. Yeah. There, are, there, are, there are some people that that think, I mean, I, I mean, I don't think that they really think this way, but they, they behave as if these animals are little machines. Yeah. And there's a set pattern to everything they do, and that's yeah, not yeah, the case. Yeah. They're individuals, and, and they are... Everything that they do is dictated by the environment, and the environment is something that you are the one providing. Yeah. Right? So, I mean... Yeah. Yeah. Very good point. I, I mean, that's the main thing with, I think, when people get gargle geckos, and for whatever reason, I've seen, like, online that gargle geckos don't require as much humidity oh as, as crested geckos <laughs> or chihuahuas. Yeah. Um, but uh, I think it's it's one of those things that it, it's an experience thing and it's like it just takes time to kind of like instill the the right information in right. people because as we, you know, as we go and we learn. If you go online, what's the number <laughs> one, like if you go on any one of the groups, what's the number one complaint that you see from people posting up? My gecko doesn't eat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. My gecko doesn't eat. Mm -hmm. My gecko doesn't eat. <laughs> and every time, it 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 it, it just kind of shows you where where the internet is a beautiful thing and a terrible thing at the same time. Yeah. So every time I see a post that says my gecko won't eat, I I, I can't answer every single one of them, right? Right. But when I see fifty posts about try Pangea X Y Z or try this diet or mine does this diet or that one does. And not a single person asks, what's your temperature. humidity or temperature? Not a single one. And I, I just, when you're, when you're trying to figure out what's wrong with your animal, the environment should always be number, should be the first thing that you look at. And, but the humidity, again, is because I believe that, unfortunately, bad information has been passed on so, so often yeah. that, that that is what's prevalent. You know? I, I go by the, the averages. You know, if you go and look on New Caledonia, what what's the annual average humidity? And the annual average is seventy, I think seventy four, seventy five percent. That that doesn't mean that there can't be pockets where it's lower or a right. night where it's lower. Right, right, right. You know, but the annual average is seventy four percent. And right. I think that's it's when you're yeah. when you're trying to keep your animal, you should be looking you don't look at what it is in September or what it is in I mean, not first, right? You should be looking at averages. What's your average temperature over the whole year, and what's an average humidity over the whole year, and that's your baseline, and and you work work off of that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, as far as um, I know, you're very big into giving gargles in particular a lot more protein than just the yes. regular commercial diets. So, what do you guys feed? What do you guys feed? Rapashi, Pangea, what uh, for or for both? gargle? I we we. We both offer both, okay. Mm -hmm. um, but for gargoyles, I, I, I do believe Rapashi is, it's a little is, is better. Okay. I, use, I use Pangea more as like a flavor additive more yeah. than anything. I don't really yeah. feed it straight. 
Um, but the Rapashi overall is way better for the gargoyles. Yeah, and you got, is there a particular, to be that guy, but is there a particular flavor you guys find that the gargoyles like the most? When it comes to, so the, the difference between the Rapashi and the Pangea, and, and I would say this goes across the board, it doesn't matter Probably. for all the, all the new, new Caledonian geckos. Oh, okay. um, I think they all need more protein. Right. Let me just say that yeah. to start off with. I think all of them need more protein than we actually give them. Mm -hmm. um, the that being said, I, I do think the Rapashi diets are more nutritious. All right. I don't want to say better because better encompasses several different things, but more nutritious. Yes. Um, less sugar than Pangea, which is something that's a it's a big deal for me. I, I, I don't see these animals eating that much sugar in the wild. Mm -hmm. They love it, but I don't see them eating it. Um, the, the Pangea, they all love it. They eat the Pangea because they like it. They eat the Rapashi because they have to eat, not yeah. because they like it. So we use, like Kelly said, we use the Pangea to flavor the Rapashi. Um, the versions, I, I try to use all of them because same. not all of them are the same. So mm -hmm. I want variety. Um, but my staples are absolutely the versions with bugs. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And um, uh, so aside from those, the, the, the diets, what are you feeding to supplement with like live bugs? How often are you feeding? Roaches, crickets, superworms, mealworms. Um, I, I can't tell you how often because I don't really have a schedule. Mm -hmm. um, we just keep the bowls full. I, in the yeah, I, I just try to keep them with food all the so time. So if you're feeding and you see the bowl of superworms is empty, you I, add I more superworms. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. so pretty much, kind of like with the, just like the regular diet, you have it available yes. for the most part at all times. Yes, the um, the, the the mixed diets are available twenty four seven. Okay, um, unless we're out of show or something like that. Right, right. right. And, the bug. <laughs> and um, what about any calcium? Do you do you supplement? Do you have calcium dish? Yes. Yes. yes? Mm -hmm. Every so that that's that's another thing that's a big deal for me. Um, I'm not one of those that subscribes to calcium overdose or D3 overdose. Okay. Because um, the way I give it to my animals, everything that I keep, not just New Caledonia stuff. If if overdose on either one of those two things was that much of a threat, most of my animals would have been dead a long time ago. I'm mm -hmm. sure. Um, so I, I don't I don't subscribe to the overdose idea. Every single um, reproductive female has access to a calcium lick, mm -hmm. whether it's a gargoyle, a crested gecko, a chihuahua, take this. It doesn't it doesn't matter what it is. Every every and, 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 and you filling are, up all the time. Yeah. And, I'm sorry, we right? refill them all the time. Yeah. Oh really? Yeah. So they're they're licking. Yeah, yeah. They, they use it for yeah. sure. Absolutely. Do you do you add anything to the diets when you prepare them? We sprinkle it on Sometimes, the yeah. um, you know, you saw I do grow a lot of um, fruits yeah, and stuff yeah. like that. So the fig, especially. So with with the diets, the, the, the overall diet for all the new Caledonian stuff, the, the thing you got to be aware of most is the calcium phosphorus ratio, mm -hmm. right? So um, metabolic bone disease. It, it's it's two diseases, and I try to tell people it's, think of it as two diseases in one. It's it's two things, but the same opposite sides of each other. If that make the head and tail of a coin, right? Okay. The same coin. Yeah. So what it is is it's a calcium phosphorus imbalance. Now you can get that. It's not a calcium deficiency alone. Right. It's both. It's it's an imbalance. So okay. you can, you can get that by having not enough calcium in the diet, or you can get that by having too much phosphorus in the diet. Right. So if you're feeding natural fruits, say you give a lot of banana, banana is really high in phosphorus, and you're not supplementing with extra calcium, mm -hmm. then your overall diet is going to be high in phosphorus, which means you're going to be low in calcium, mm -hmm. right? So it's it's the same end product, but you actually got there two mm -hmm. different ways, if I'm making sense, yes, right? right. Um, so anytime that you have, that you do see some issues like that, keep in mind that there's two aspects to it. It could be too much phosphorus in the diet, or it could be not enough calcium. And also sometimes neglect. Yeah, um, yeah, that it could be. Well, that would be protein, like the the wavy tail. Yes. Right no. on babies. On babies, or even even, even, even adults for that matter. Yeah. Sometimes, 
Um, I used to, in the beginning, I used to swear that the wavy tail was calcium issues. Okay. And, and over time, um, my thoughts on that changed because I saw it happen in situations where calcium deficiencies didn't quite seem to fit and make a whole lot of sense. I think when you're with, for the new Caledonia stuff, when we see the wavy tail, I think that is primarily stress, right? Yes. Um, it is, it's caused by stress. Now, what is stressing the animal? Now, several things can be stressed in the animal. Dehydration, low calcium, low protein, low vitamin, mineral content. You know, there's, there's multiple things that can cause stress, but the stress itself, I think, is what causes the wavy tail mm -hmm. um, because there are, there are multiple fixes for it. I've had it where I supplement extra calcium and that can fix it. Um, believe it or not, man, more protein, right? So in some of the experiments, when I'd get wavy tails, I'd start feeding them, getting those animals to take bugs off of tongs, and it goes away like that. And so you could argue, too, that that could be um, a little bit of dehydration. Yeah. Right? I mean, because if they're There's eating, bugs, eating the bugs, there, there is some bit of moisture in there. Yeah. Um, but the difference that, that it makes in some individuals will lead me to believe that it's more, it's probably more... Um, it's probably a stress-related like, issue. Uh, yeah, um, 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 a nutrient. A nutrient was the word I was trying to okay. think of. A, a nutrient issue. Okay. Um, and, and it's not not always calcium. Not always no. Calcium. Okay. Um, yeah, I see. Because you know, it, for whatever reason, it's gargles in particular. Um, sometimes leeches too. Yeah. That they hatch and they have the wavy tail. You know, and the egg can look perfect, you know, but sometimes the babies will hatch, you know, and right away they have that wavy tail. And that, that's, yeah. that could be a little humidity. That could be low humidity yeah. as well yeah. from the, like, incubation. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah so another thing that, that I commonly hear a lot, and there is validity to it. I'm not saying it's com that I don't agree with it completely. Um, a, a lot of people will incubate the eggs lower to make the babies bigger. Mm -hmm. And and there there is like I said there is validity to that because I think the slower the metabolism the more time that that yeah, that baby that has to grow. Stuff, yeah. I think I but going back to what's number the biggest difference between babies little babies and big babies is humidity 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 for these guys it's it's all about humidity. Yeah. What what I had noticed over the years is that um, you know where I'm running my incubators if I don't if I don't keep the the, the water dish, I keep a separate water dish in the Inside incubator. The incubator. Yeah. Um, and if I don't stay on top of that and keep that, when it goes dry, I've seen smaller babies. When mm -hmm. I keep it nice and humid and keep it full in there, my babies come out bigger. So I would argue that big baby versus little baby, it's more, again, not saying temperature doesn't play a role, because it does, okay. Um, okay. but I think humidity is, is a bigger player. So if so a baby hatches out with a with a wavy tail is your first thought, let me get this thing hydrated. Hydrated, mm -hmm. yeah. And then afterwards, if it still has a wavy tail, then you go for the calcium. Well, okay, so there's it it there are other factors that we can consider, right? So um, if it's just one baby that pops out, then yes, I, I would be going toward humidity being being the factor first. Now let's say this was the third baby from this mom, mm, right? Okay, okay, right? Right? And so if this was the third baby to come out of this mom, then I'm going to be looking at probably more calcium, more of a, a vitamin and mineral deficiency of some sort rather than calcium. Mm -hmm. I mean, rather than humidity right off the bat. Okay. Um, yeah, so knowing a little bit of history on the animal, it depends right. on what, what time of year it is too. At right? the end so of the year. If yeah. you're, right. you're, you're more likely year. to get that kind of stuff toward the end of the year than you are in the beginning of the year. Smaller babies. Do you, do you, um, I, I, I started doing this a couple years back, um, but like towards the end of the year, and even sometimes throughout the year, I'll give the females some liquid calcium. True. Even if, you know, it's not, she's not like crashing or whatever, or right. has a wavy yeah. tail, but I'll just, I'll just add it in their diet or I'll mm -hmm. directly give it to her. Yeah. Um, and, and I find that has helped, like that has maintained our eggs a lot nicer. Right, exactly. Not as much uh, jagged like little eggs and stuff. Keep a calcium liquid, they'll do the same thing. Yeah, yeah, you know what, that's something I, I don't do. I don't put a calcium dish in there, but I'm gonna start they doing it. Yes, they, they use will. it, they use it. We put it right yeah. by the food dishes and they, they use it. I used to add it to the food when I mix, you know, mix a diet, I'd add it in. Yeah. Um, but I found that they, overall, they don't need it. 
Mm-hmm. And yeah, so they, they don't like the taste. It throws off the pH in the diet, and it makes right. it go bad yeah. quick. So they're like, eh. Yeah. yeah. So the, the solution that I started doing to that, instead of mixing it into the diet, and and I don't do that quite as much now, um, but instead of mixing it, I'd mix all my portion on my diet and then sprinkle it over the top of the diet. Mm-hmm. Oh, so okay, okay. that when they go to eat it, they're, that's they're the first thing. That's the first thing. Yeah. yeah. Right. And nice. that's that seemed to work really work out really good. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, How often are you guys doing that? When I was doing that, I would do that like every other feeding. What, the sprinkling? Yeah. I, I sprinkle the diet for the babies and the adults every time I feed. And then I make sure that they all have, well, the babies, I don't give them the calcium, so they get it sprinkled on top. But the adults, I always make sure I refill, and then I sprinkle the food with the calcium. So. Okay, that's interesting. That's something I'm, I'm going to do, too, because I don't. I don't always have bugs in there like you guys, and mm-hmm. I don't always have a calcium dish. In there. I don't ever have a calcium dish in there. Mm-hmm. Remember though, we're so. push. I mean, if you're keeping, yeah, we're we're you're, you're them. keeping them in a group. You're pushing. Yeah. So, a little bit of background on the animals, right? So when, when I was doing all my studies on it, uh, one of the things I wanted to see was how how many clutches do they lay, you know, from a breeding, right? Mm-hmm. And this is one of the crazy things that. It, it took me a little while to understand it. I, I, I think gargoyles only store enough sperm to lay three clutches from, from one breeding. From one breeding. Right? So um, th- that's why I came about to keeping animals together all year instead, of, instead of doing you know doing random groups. When I first – so they're, they're not communal animals. They don't want to be together, right? You put them together, you're taking a risk of them hurting each other. So that wasn't my first route. It, first route was one on one, more more so, or one and one and two kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. And so what I noticed was by not having a male there, I was getting throughout the season. I'd get a, a pretty good amount of infertile, non fertilized eggs. I want to say infertile. They, they were just right. not fertilized. Right. right. And so what I started doing is I put the animals together and then separate them and, and see how many clutches that she would lay from, from a single breeding. And on average, what I got was six eggs, three clutches. And then the female no longer was producing viable eggs after that. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> In fact, I used that for, <clears throat> for many years. <clears throat> I'd use that as a marker. Like if I was switching animals up mm-hmm. to try to make sure that I was, was keeping track of my bloodlines. Mm-hmm. So, if I wanted to put a new male with a female, I would, would separate her and let her do three dud clutches, right? Wow. Thinking, okay, well, she's empty. Now she's empty. I can put her with the new male. So any any new sperm will be from this new male. And then I had a shocker one year that opened my eyes that, that showed me that that whole method probably is not something that I can count on. Now, I do believe that they, they only make enough to make three clutches for the most part. Right. Um, but I had a... A two, it was three animals. It was two males and a female. The female wasn't really super unique, but the males that I was trying to breed her with, both of them in both cases were totally 100% unique males. I mean, like nothing like them in the rest of my collection. And so I had this female with male A. She was with him for a whole year, separated him. She laid three good clutches after I separated him. Followed by three bad clutches. All right, so this is six months, a whole yeah, a, a six month period. Um, because of the timing, I did not put her in with. I, I I only put my animals together during a certain time of the year. That they don't go together, then they don't go together at all. Cooler months. Um, right, right now, so September, October, and November. My my cutoff is the winter solstice. If animals are not paired by the winter solstice, they do not get paired for the season. Mm-hmm. So right now, you're starting to pair new. Yeah, yeah, right now is the time to do it. Um, okay. And, I, I and see if you want, we can, we can go into why, why I say that, why yeah. I do that. Um, yeah, less fighting your, sure. your odds of success go up and your odds of conflict go down. Mm-hmm. Do you lower the temperatures? No. No? Stay I mean, the same? I, I don't well, manipulate yeah. it. Yeah, whatever, yeah, whatever Mother Nature does, but I don't manipulate it beyond what Mother Nature does. Okay. Um, that's interesting. So... Because I had, I, I, I was, the way I do it is I pair up gargoyles, uh, pretty much all my geckos. At a certain, like in November, I drop the temperatures on my gecko room. Mm-hmm. I lower them. Like, right now my gecko room is around like 76 degrees. Mm-hmm. 
during November, I start to bring it down to 70, like four, and then I'll even get to 72. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so around like in November, I'll start putting up whatever, if I'm pairing up geckos, I'll, that's when I start to do it. And I'll let them kind of like sit in the cooler period together. And then as it starts to, you know, warm back up, that's when they start producing again. Mm -hmm. um, but you're, you do it a little bit earlier than I do. I'm well, curious. I, I, would, I would break the year for, for the new Caldo and stuff. I, can, I would break the year down into three, three seasons, if you will. Right? There's the break season, there's breeding season, and then there's egg laying season. Um, again, I'm not manipulating temperatures or anything in, that, in, in my room. It's, it's, um, they are all reacting to what nature the, the, the natural changes that I get. Mm -hmm. And so what I see in my, in my collection, and it's the same when I was in New Jersey, it's, a, it's, I see the same exact thing here. Um, to me, their number one influence is daylight. How, how many hours of daylight are there and barometric pressure, mm -hmm. not, not temperature. Again, I, I, even, I would say temperature is the last thing. probably the last thing that affects them. Number one is, is the number of hours during the day and, and barometric pressure, and both of those are, are very tied into weather. Right. Okay? And so in the wintertime, you generally experience low pressures. In the summertime, in the heat, you generally experience high pressures. And so that's what the animals are feeling. That's how they're telling, in my opinion, that's how they're telling summer and winter. Okay. Right? So summertime, or excuse me, wintertime, September, is when the days really start to, to shorten significantly. Um, your, your barometric pressure on average goes up because that's when we start getting the, the rougher weather. And in my collection, that's when the animals start shutting down. That's yeah, they, they, they for the most part, I would say that most of my animals stop laying eggs by September. I, we still get a couple stragglers, but yeah. Now, do you, do you keep even during this time, do you keep your, you, your gargle males with the females all year all and they just, the year. females just yeah. stop? Okay. Yeah. No, so actually we'll come back to that. The, the reason I did that we were going on because they do three clutches. And so what I found out, what, what I realized early on was to me, it, it took, it takes a, the female the same amount of energy to produce an infertile egg as it does a fertilized egg. I, for the female, it doesn't matter. I, I, at least I don't see a difference. Right. Same. Um, I, I agree. So when I realized that they were only, only producing three clutches from a breeding, it, it was imperative. I mean, if the female's going to cycle and go through all that energy in any, any, anyway, it only made sense for me to have it. The male has to be there. It has to be available when, when, whenever the female is receptive. And that's why I started doing groups. And so then the next one was because they fight and they don't like to be in groups. How, how do I solve the problem with them getting along? And so more experiments. I experimented everything from one to one to 1 1.7, seven females and one male. Yeah. And, and what I found for, for me, what seemed to work the best was four females to one male. Um, more than four females it seems to be too much. Too much. And, and I, I didn't get production, very good production out of the group. He seemed to be spread a little thin. Um, anything less than four females, and I would have problems with the females, the because fe he'd be picking on you know one, one female, female more than the others, and so four females seems to be the right ratio to give him options, you know, give the other girls breaks, but still have a male available all the time. Mm -hmm. um, so the 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 one that I was going on the two males that um, that made me switch that whole thing around. So that one female, she laid three good clutches, three bad clutches. We went through the winter break. I paired her with the new male. Now gestation is 30 days, give or take, right? So I put her in with the new male, but male B. 30 days later, I get a clutch of eggs. And this is where this was the time where I was doing two different incubators. So this animal in particular, the first clutch I had taken one egg and I had separated the clutches. So the time the second clutch came around, those went in there. The first clutch egg hatched mm -hmm. at the same time as the second clutch egg. They hatched together. Right, and, and the different incubator in, in a different incubator, yeah, because they, different were, temperatures? they were, yeah, because they were a month apart, right? So, okay. um, I at, well, because it was actually it was two clutches in, so I ended up getting that first, the first egg. How did it, how did it work? Because it, it, two eggs hatched this like literally the same day from from either male. Okay, it was. It had to be the third clutch, her first clutch, second clutch, and then the third clutch, and so 
the first clutch hatched, they were the spitting image of the new the male. male. The new, oh, no, oh, the, the new, new male, male, male okay. B, right? Which is what I exactly yeah, what I expected. What the second clutch that hatched were the spitting image of male A that she was with over a year before that. So without a doubt, she had held sperm for 14, 15, 15 months. Wow. And the crazy thing was, is she not only had sperm in her from for that long, but she laid, but she laid eggs from, from, two, different, the other from two different males. Yeah. yeah. Right? So probably what happened is one male bred her on one side, and she stored sperm there, and the other male bred yeah. her on the other side, and, and she just yeah. ovulated from, from either side. Right. But still, that's crazy. It, it's still crazy, mind blowing, yeah. I mean, to, to say the least. Um, yeah, so that kind of threw. I still maintain that the average is is, like three, is three clutches. Three clutches. Well, do you, do so. you what what do you? I've never done experiments with this, but what would happen if you have a? Um, I mean, I guess you kind of answered it, but if you have a male in with a female, and let's say like you, because you want to change that male up, so you you take that male away, and you put a new male. Do you have you ever experimented to like aside from that like accidental experiment? Um, have you ever seen that she goes back and forth or is it like what once she like that female after she used up that retained sperm did she ever lay again from no. that eight male no, no. no it's everything once. everything after that came from from the from male, male B from male yeah. B okay yeah. um, yes and no so I, I did do experiments where I switched stuff up like that but to be quite honest with you um, the one I just told you about is the only one I can that I can say for sure because the because males are so different. unique, mm -hmm. right? All in in all the other cases, and because of the randomness that you 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 totally see, well, yeah. it, there's no way for me to say with certainty, right? And that that was why I would hold a female back for almost a year before putting her with another male, mm -hmm. so that I could be sure because a lot of times when I was switching those males. You know, if I'm breeding for red stripes and the new male is just a, he's a better version of the old male, right? Wanna, so yeah. I, there's there's no way to know for sure um, if if you're overlapping. And now nowadays I do do overlapping because um, when I'm switching out for my groups, I'm I'm breeding. If I'm putting an animal switching out, say a group three, the the goal is the same. So that animal's genetics are geared toward the same as the genetics and the rest of there. So it, it, it doesn't matter if she's got a holdover sperm from last year. Oh, right, 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 right. The, the goal is still the same. The goal is still the same, right. Um, whereas in the beginning, you know, that, that was different. That would change. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, um, are you seeing that, um, obviously the red is pretty, it's very dominant. It passes yes. down very, very easy. Do you see that the red, um, Kind of like attaches itself better to the reticulated making blotches or to stripes like is it in other words are, is it passing down easier is it easier to make fully red striped animals or fully red blotched animals yes and no so um you're you're talking kind of what you're you're asking is apples and oranges all right so what what i would say because you're you're asking about pattern and you're asking about pattern color, yeah, which is two complete, two independent traits, right? Right. Um, so pattern, like I said, it depends on the history of the animal, yeah. Which which one is going to be more dominant? Um, now pattern color, whether whether it's in reticulated animals, i.e. super blotch, or a striped animal, a six stripe super stripe, pattern color is the trait doesn't doesn't matter which pattern it's in right so if you have a high color six stripe animal yeah the that pattern color trait is the same in in a reticulated animal it's just that the pattern changes you follow does that make sense y yeah so, so for color there's two traits base color and pattern color right and and they are not intertwined with pattern whatsoever so if you have a high color stripe and you breed it to a retic Mm -hmm. Can you get super stripes or super blotches? Yeah. Well, How do you think I made mine to begin with? Yeah. Right. So, because again, going back to genetics, it's it's a matter of gene stacking, if you will. So, what's most dominant in the United States from the very beginning, from as soon as I can remember, the the and it still is today for the most part. The the most desired color pattern 
in gargoyles is red That's stripe. True. It's still to this day. Mm -hmm. So red stripes tend to be the dominant two characters, characteristics that go across the board. So in the early days, trying to produce these blotches, right, um, it, 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 was, it was difficult because everything that you bred stripes to made blotches. So in that respect, where, where the super blotch is hard to get and still to this day somewhat hard to get, yes. But I think if people... It's just realize, because we're so focused on stripes and that's the case. Well, because I, I think that not a lot of people realize too that the, that pattern color yeah. is a trait unto itself. Yeah. Right? So you can breed for pattern color regardless of the actual it. pattern yeah, that yeah, you're yeah. looking for. And so when when I wanted to when I had that vision and I wanted to make that you know that first blotch and I wanted to color over the whole animal, um, I had striped animals that were fully colored. Yeah. And so I had hatched a couple super blotches kind of random out of out of reticulated animals, but they also were not producing male. And so I kept, I, I, they, and they were very random. You know, I might get one for every 15 or 20 that I produce. Mm -hmm. And oh, so, right. so the way to get more to, I, what I did with, with Rack House in the beginning is I tried to play the odds with numbers, right? So from the very beginning, I purchased a lot of animals and I tried to get as many animals as I could mm -hmm. just to breed as many animals as I could. The more animals you breed, the more likely you are to get you know, whatever that color or pattern that you're looking for in the end. Right. And so because I had a lot of animals, I could experiment. And because of those experiments, I did. I took really high striped color animals, bred them with blotches. And a couple of my original super blotch lines started like okay. that. Yeah, I'm sorry for the bottom. <laughs> yeah, no. And, and, and it, the, the pattern, fortunately for gargoyles, is why I say too. I mean, so I keep myself as... If I didn't have some of the rules in my breeding, you know, by not keeping everything three generations, yeah. Um, sometimes I, I, you know, I don't want to go against my morals, and I've done it for this long. Yeah. But and, and just to be clear, what we're talking about is is like line breeding, like bringing yes. that same blood back to it. He waits three generations apart right. before he he right. breeds it back. Because like we were saying before off camera, is like there's a lot of you could get really incredible research really quick but you might have to do something like you might have to breed for example siblings back to each other a month yes. to to offspring and that may work sometimes but a lot of times it's doubling down on something bad that could be internal on the animal that you might not be able to visually see um, yeah. I think I, I, these animals we talked about it these animals are inbreeding in the wild mm -hmm. um, so you know there is a even though it's not what I do, there is, I think there is a certain degree of acceptability as far as that goes. Yeah. Um, but what I was looking for is I was, for me, for my name, for the animals that I produce, I was looking for the long-term um, genetic um, stability, right? That not breeding um, related animals yeah. brings. Yeah. You're going to have a bottle. Like you're gonna, yes. Yep. Well, but, it, and I also played the numbers, right? So, Kind of the same thing there. Whereas, you know, you might have Joe Schmo who goes and buys, you know, my nicest animal and your nicest animal and breeds them together. Now they're making these absolutely incredible looking animals. Um, yeah, I mean, does my way take a little bit longer? Um, it does, but I, I do think, um, I think we get better genetic animals that way. But by producing, by playing the numbers, so for my super blotch group, I've got. Um, how many groups this year or last year? Like six or seven, seven yeah. groups that are focused just on super blotches. Yeah. And so by playing the numbers, right, I can take the best three out of, or I can take the best one about, out of every single one of those groups mm -hmm. right off the bat and breed them together because they're they're not directly, they're completely not directly separate. related. Yeah. Um, but if I took two of my group thirties, man. That's why we hoard everything. <laughs> we yeah. hoard everything. I mean, I mean. <laughs> my, my group 30 is my strongest super blotch group. That that group produces 100% super blotches every season, right? Now, there's variability in how nice they 100. are. Okay, right. right. I mean, not every single one of them is that $10,000 animal, mm -hmm. right? But, you know, 90% of them are. Um, but it is producing 
100% super blotch animals. Mm -hmm. There's there's no, you know, one or two hits and misses and yeah. I mean, it, if if I'm if it's making ten babies a season, I'm getting ten super blotches out of it. Wow. Um, I have a red based male that makes babies that look exactly like him, and no matter what I put him to. Really? Yeah, never, there are some some males are genetically blessed has, that way. Never has any variation. He always has that pattern on all the babies. Blotches. I put him with like a super watch. Same thing. Red base stripe. <laughs> like, really? And he makes males. All males. Well, yeah. there you go. His his that's that's a, that's a downside. Yep. Yeah. Super strong. Yeah. So yeah. we we have we have since identifying these male makers, we have taken, removed them. They are yes. not in groups anymore. Yeah. I'll put them back when want I happen. want males, but like, yeah. right. it, they just make way too many males and they're just getting a break. <laughs> do, do you guys um, have any like annual preventatives that you do for parasites because, you know, from cleaning yes. bugs and stuff? Do you guys yes, every year do a, like, cl like I actually do it every, them? every like, Probably every six to eight months. Oh, really? I do panicure. You panicure them? Mm -hmm. mine panicure. Baycox yeah. for coccidia. I always treat all new animals that come to my facility with Baycox, which treats coccidia, and then panicure. Okay. So if you're feeding bugs. Yeah, you're gonna, you're get, gonna, you're, you're get, gonna pinworms. get parasites. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and pinworms at, at the very at a minimum. Yeah. It's just it is what it is. And it's it's a it's a task to do all those animals. Yeah. With panicure. But I, so, I dose it all up and I do you. Everything. You do you do individual or you mix individual, it in? Individual, individual, individual. Yeah, I, I take a small. How often? Yeah, like Every, how, how many treatments? Oh, I do it three times in a row, for one week, and then I stop. Because okay. if they start getting like runny stool or anything like that, yeah. I kind of quit it. But usually, if I see an animal that actually does have the worms, yeah, I'll give I'll do it for three days in a row. Sometimes yeah. with smaller animals, I don't recommend doing it. Um, you could add like tiny drops into the food just to try and help prevent it. Yeah. Um, but it, it does upset their stomach. It does strip everything out of their stomach. So right. it really is not. I've, I've also like, so, um, from talking to other breeders and stuff, a lot of people also do it like at the end of the season when everybody stops slaying because it will just, you know, right. like, kill production. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 And that's why I do it. So, so, you know, and it, even, I mean, you could argue too that doing it preventative is maybe not always the best idea. Yeah. No, honestly, yeah. I, I kind of, I usually I, do I, I rarely treat them unless I see like a particular problem with an animal. Right. Exactly. Because I, I, I think that to a certain degree, if the animal's kept healthy and they it's manage kept, it. they manage it. Mm -hmm. And every single animal in the wild has it. First thing that I saying? always look for when I, when, I, when I see an animal that needs help or needs warming, weight loss. Yeah. Weight loss, runny stool, yeah. blood in the stool. That's yeah. all signs that you need to. to, to yeah. Yeah. Just just doing, just doing it as a, a I, I, yeah. I think doing it as a regular preventative. I think you can do more harm because yeah. that stuff kills. There's a lot of there's a lot of fauna in their gut that they need. Yeah. And mm -hmm. that stuff kills, kills all that. of it. Yeah. And how how do you do you so this is something I used to do, um, like I. The, there's a probiotics that I used to add to their gecko to mm -hmm. the gecko diet that I would get mm -hmm. from um, the vet. He's a uh, I don't know one of our vets here that's very popular in Florida. Um, but I used to get him. I used to get that probiotic, and I would always add it to the diet. Mm -hmm. it, do you guys add any probiotics or anything I like that? I do probiotic prebiotic mixture, and you can get that at any tractor supply. Mm -hmm. um, and I would just do it in low doses. I would even, if you have a lot of animals, I would do the full scoop for for the one batch. Yeah. So that for the way, batch of food. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we did do that for in my collection for a little while, but not not now. We have. Yeah. I only do that like, because usually in winter sometimes they'll get runny stool or something like that. When they're cooling off, they'll start getting a little bit of a runny stool, and that's mm -hmm. usually when I do try and look through everybody and warm everybody that needs to be warm. But I really don't do the babies very often. The babies really take it hard. Yeah, I, yeah, I don't, I don't really yeah. do babies. Yeah. Um. Yeah, man. I, I, I want to start wrapping it up, but. I appreciate you guys so much, man. There's a, so much good information that, that you just spilled over here. 
And we'll have to I, do it again so you can get some more. Yeah, oh, no, I know. It, Listen, yeah, it feels up to me. You should come to my house and see all yeah, the critters. <laughs> I'll, I'll take you up on that. Um, I, I think uh, there's so much. Obviously, there's something like an experience that you have that is you can't. Doesn't matter how much money you pay, how how, how nice your animals are, you're mm -hmm. not gonna get unless you have that time into it. Mm -hmm. And this is like kind of like the cheat code of like just picking your brain and like having it out there for people that you know may just start breeding that they're gonna already learn from our mistakes and they're not gonna have to go. So all yes, that. yes. I mean, I see a difference. I see a difference in the animals now from the beginning. Yeah. Right. Um, and if, if we could make the same difference in another 15 or 20 years, then uh, that would be a good thing, you know? Yeah. I'm I mean, we used to feed them baby them. food for yeah, pizza, yeah, yeah. you know? Yeah. yeah. I, I was at the end of that when we fed baby food, right. turkey with peach yeah. and right. some of the calcium. Right, exactly, exactly, yeah. So we've come, I think we've, we've done a good job so far, and, and there's still obviously room for improvement. Oh, man, if, if you know, I, in, it, keeping the animals, what I get out of it is learning. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. I'm watching the animals and you know I, I always refer to my experiments if I, I I'm the kind of person I need to know if I see the animals doing something I need to know why mm -hmm. um, or how or, or whatever it is or make the, and then make the experiment to try to, to figure that out and um, if it's one thing I've learned I will never stop learning <laughs> yeah yeah exactly. right I mean there is always I mean, if you think you know something, yes. then it's I learned every, like, a lot of stuff from him. Yeah. A lot of stuff. And I, you know, I was like, you know, I've got this dumb hat. No. You know, yeah. when I, yeah. you know, when you asked me how I got started and I told you about the book and I read through the book and it was, yeah. right. So that was one of my motivations because I figured, you know, I can, this is my opportunity to, to um, get my foot in the door and understand this species when nobody else understands it so much right so ever since then the idea of writing a book right I mean it's why I do the experiments it's why I do all the stuff that I do is to try to write a book and I just we were talking about it this weekend and I have this mind block because because of my experience with the first book right so I've, I've been hesitant to actually put everything down on paper yeah because what if I change my mind right it goes to print and it comes out, make a new book. and then, yeah. and then yeah. everything that I go, right, is totally but, but different. It's, yeah, but it's not like what you know now is completely invalid. You know, no. it's still, it still holds No, but th things will change. No, yeah. things will change. On the way back from, um, from Tinley, because um, quite a few people, strangely enough, had mentioned that podcast that I did like 10 years yeah. ago. And yeah. so I hadn't, you know, I haven't listened to it forever. So I was like, you know what, let's listen to it. I want to hear what it. I'm, dude, that was terrible. It was so horrible. <laughs> but I, That's, in 10 years, you'll listen to yeah. this. Yeah, I'll probably say the same thing. But I'm, I was listening to that, and there were even things that I said there that today I'd be like, in, like with the humidity. I kept saying, like, don't go below 50%. Yeah. Right now, I chastise people if they tell them they got their, fifth, their humidity at 50%. Yeah. Like, yeah. You're, you're killing your animal, man. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, yeah. If I, I hope that I'm going to keep learning until. Until the day we are always I, here I to help under. though like I always like anytime anybody has any questions I'm always there I'm always yeah. there anytime you have a question don't hesitate everybody's like oh you're so busy no I have yeah. time for you yeah I have time for you yeah. and you you can ask me whatever you want yeah. same with Paul he makes time for it that's so, awesome yeah thank you guys so much man thank you so Paul Rockhouse is there anything you want to plug or rockhouse.com Rock or Facebook Rock mostly, right? Yeah, we're on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mostly on Facebook. We're working on um, the website. Okay, yeah, I got it. And Eclipse. I'm mostly Facebook and Work Market. Okay, Eclipse Exotics. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll put all the information down below if you guys want to find these guys. But amazing gargoyle breeders. Um, I think if you have, you know, any serious collection of gargoyles, you have some of their animals. <laughs> yes. Um, so definitely appreciate the time breaking bread and, you know, over here talking about everything. So yeah, thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Thank you guys. It was a pleasure. Awesome. <laughs>